you were always designed to fail. So you would buy the next diet or weight loss industry product, right? We're all in our own little <laughs> corner going, rah, 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 rah. hit me producer pots. You should only eat meat. Vegetables are toxic. You should only eat vegetables. Meat is unhealthy. Where do you think the demonization of whole foods started and why can't we all just get along and respect each other's food choices? Where did it start? I mean, that's that's a good question. I feel like um, it probably started at the dawn of nutritional sciences, like during the chemical re revolution, like during the early 1800s. Um, there's some really interesting historical anecdote stories that I tell in my book, Nutribor, the radical new science for getting the nutrients you need from the foods you eat, that actually kind of look at some of like the origins of nutrition misinformation. Like uh, misinformation about foods went viral long before the internet, right? And so there's some really interesting like characters who were basically making moral judgments of foods and the people eating them um, before we even knew about like vitamins, <laughs> like a hundred years before we knew about vitamins, before we understood like the Krebs cycle, which is like the cellular metabolism, like how, how we use energy to do things in cells. Um, and so the, the origins of this food is good, this food is bad, is like politicians and charismatic scientists from the late 1700s, early 1800s, making assumptions based on very preliminary research. And then that assumption basically becoming common knowledge years, decades, centuries before the science showing that it was a bad assumption is actually ever performed. Um, and I think that's that's just, I mean, that cycle has continued over the last couple hundred years of, um, you know, someone promoting something for weight loss or for health, but usually it's weight loss, right? Um, that's not at all based in scientific evidence where it's not, you know, maybe it, it works, but it's not at all sustainable because it's so restrictive. And I think that, you know, one of the challenges is this probably goes back to like the low fat diet craze of the seventies and eighties, which was not just weight loss centered, but also like heart health, right? Let's be terrified of, of fats because they clog your arteries. Um, kind of like there was a health aspect to that, uh, you know, not nuanced enough information uh, of, of the time that preceded the really important science done in the 90s and early 2000s that really helped show like all of the important moving parts here to, to consider. But I think that one of the things that that started is um, not just like the moralization of foods because that goes back a couple hundred years, but thinking about diet in terms of what you avoid, what you restrict, right? A low fat diet. And then in the early nineties, that became a low carb diet, right? And then we had this whole, oh, Ansel Keys uh, was wrong in all these ways. I mean, there was definitely problems with Ansel Keys work. Um, and then uh, the carbohydrate insulin hypothesis of obesity, which then low carb diets took off before the research like a couple decades before the research was done to show that that's not how it works. Um, so, um, so the, the, again, it's like the same cycle of someone making an assumption based on preliminary science that then becomes popular before the actual rigorous science is performed that shows that that assumption was incorrect over and over and over again. But the thing that happened, the, the switch that happened in the seventies and eighties of thinking about diet in terms of what you avoid is that that lent itself to a couple of really interesting like human psychology things right so if you define a diet based on what you avoid and you find success on that diet you credit the things you cut out not the things that you ate instead right like i cut out meat or vegetables or fat or carbs or whatever right I, I, or I cut out whatever grains. Um, and I saw 
we're probably measuring success based on weight and not health markers. We're probably not doing this based on our cholesterol or blood pressure. We're probably just doing this based on the scale. But I saw improvements in this, 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 this. Uh, wow, that really worked. And then you hit the limits of what that particular dietary approach can provide. Or you hit the binge restrict cycle where you can't sustain that diet because it was never a structure that was designed to be sus sustainable. You were always designed to fail. So you would buy the next diet or weight loss industry product, right? But you hit that moment where you're like, you can't do it anymore. And as you're like getting back on the bandwagon or you're looking to iterate to get that next bit of weight loss or level of improvement of whatever you're measuring, if you credit what you cut out for your success, like the natural next thing is to uh, cut out more, right? You're gonna go, well, I cut out all these things and that got me, you know, X, Y, Z. Well, then I will cut out the next, the next tier, right? I will cut out more things. And so we've seen this like iterative uh, growing of popularity of ever more restrictive diet patterns basically since the 70s. So we kind of have the biggies, right? Uh, you know, vegetarian and veganism, uh, low fat, low carb, and then you have the iterations on that, right? Paleo, uh, keto, carnivore, which is iterating on what happens when we're, when we're crediting the foods we avoid is we're also very susceptible to now viewing those foods as bad now viewing those foods as toxic now viewing those foods as inflammatory and now having an open mind to this next tier of foods also being inflammatory and toxic right and and bad and so it's actually propelled healthism the uh erroneous belief that health is entirely our personal responsibility and directly tied to our diet and lifestyle and nothing else um, but it's also kind of propelled this moralization of food that goes hand in hand with healthism because when we apply a moral judgment to food and label this food is good and this food is bad, we take on those moral judgments of those foods when we eat those foods. I'm a good person because I ate my good foods. You must be a bad person because I see you eating those bad foods, right? Like it, it all kinds of goes hand in hand. And I think it's part just that nutritional sciences is a really young science relative to other fields, like relative to, uh, it's actually, <laughs> chemistry is fairly young too, like the chemical revolution and uh, nutritional sciences uh, overlapped quite, quite a lot. Um, but say young compared to physics or astronomy or uh, right the invention of the microscope and the discovery of the cell. So uh, there's a lot of fields of science that are much older and more established. And so we've kind of already let go of the, you know, the sun must revolve around the earth, bad ideas. We, we let go of those a few hundred years ago, right? And we're just kind of <laughs> in that phase with nutritional sciences where it's kind of like Copernicus going, no guys, I'm pretty sure we go around the sun. I'm pretty sure the sun is the center of the solar system. And everyone being like, uh, no, you, you, you bad. That's kind of like the phase of, of, uh, discovery that we're in with nutritional science, where we've got that body of scientific evidence showing that a plant forward omnivore diet is the most health supportive, um, is the easiest way to get all of our nutrition, which means there's a place in our diets for both plant foods and animal foods, but we want to understand the relative proportions that, that they play. Um, but we're in that phase where there's so much misinformation and uh, people who don't understand the science weighing in on the science that there's a lot of not constructive debate. So all that to say that diet choices are complex and sometimes they are driven by moralization of foods and this long history of dietary recommendations preceding the, the necessary science to underpin them. Um, but that also doesn't mean that we can't respect each other's food choices. So as much as I think like the default setting on Nutrivore is, as I said, plant forward omnivore, it, it doesn't mean that if you want to apply the Nutrivore dietary philosophy of getting all of the nutrients your body needs from the foods you eat over top of a different dietary structure that you have found works for you, that doesn't mean that that is like the wrong way to approach it. So the other aspect to this, which you, you know, alluded to in your question is the polarization, 
right, is the I'm right, you're wrong type of animosity that we get within different corners, right? We're all in our own little corner <laughs> going, rah, 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 you, you know, like, how dare you? And I think that the, the um, science, like the data-driven approach to nutritional sciences and the Nutriver philosophy also reveal that there's many different ways to meet our nutritional needs. Like, yes, plant forward omnivores, probably the most efficient, but it's not the only way. If you want to do this on a plant-based diet, you absolutely can. You want to do it on a low carb diet, low fat, like what, like there are ways to do it. If you want to do this on carnivore, there's probably, or vegan, there's some nutrients now that may need supplementation, right? But it doesn't mean that it's incompatible with the Nutriper philosophy. So all this to say, part, part of this is the, just how uh, people have spread nutrition information for 200 years. Part of this is the natural, like psychological consequences of how we've been thinking about diets for the last 50 years. And then part of it is uh, the way we kind of find our our little camps and our little confirmation bubble by like bias bubbles of safety on the internet and, um, you know, have a hard time being open to other people's ideas or information that contradicts our previously held beliefs. So there's like also a piece of this that's just um, how hard it is to, you know, go go out there and learn. So um, so my my call to action, if you will, uh, in this conversation is um, is to to understand that science is a process that nutritional sciences is very young. There's still things that we don't know with certainty. There's still lots, there's lots of things that we do know uh, with certainty, but also even when we're looking at scientific studies, we're looking at what works on average and not every person is well represented by the average. And so to understand that that means you can experiment and figure out what works for you. I hope that's a conversation you have with your doctor or another a you know professional like a rec registered dietitian um but we can all exist in this space together and be open to learning and not judge each other for our food choices excellent i'll just wrap up with saying you know we can all have friends in our lives that eat differently than us and we don't yell at them or get angry at them or tell them they're wrong at least I hope we don't I mean I hope not do, I hope not yeah but we we do it far too often on the internet and it's easy to forget you're there's a real person there that you're talking to on the internet and so I think a good rule of thumb is if if you wouldn't say it to your friend in real life don't say it on the internet <laughs> i think that's a good way because really it doesn't matter if you like butter and your friend likes olive oil it just doesn't matter you know in the grand scheme of of, of life but thank you dr sarah this was so good i really appreciate your context around this conversation and i hope that we can all have a bit more balance and like you said, respect and not judge each other for what we each choose is best for us to eat. While being open to new information, which That's is right. hard. I understand <laughs> and it's tough, it's tough. Um, but it is how we grow as humans. Excellent.